Good morning, Doug. Good morning. Good, good morning. How's it going? Getting started. Yeah. Hey, Remy. Hey. Uh, hey, Eric. Morning. And Matt. Matt, are you there? All right, about Timur. Hey, Doug, I'm here. Hi. Hey, Vlad, it's been a while. Hey, Doug. Yeah, sorry, I retired slash took a sabbatical and somebody did a tiny profile on me a couple of days ago and they were like, and he's involved in the serverless working group. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> forgot about that. I forgot about all the fun we're having over here. I didn't. I know yours. I kept re reading the emails and the updates, but yeah. I needed a break. Sorry. <laughs> Understood. Yo, Tommy. Yo. All right. Uh, somebody's pinging me. Matthew wrote in uh, the chat that he's here. Oh, okay. Cool. Thank you. So, how are you all doing? How is life? Doing good. Doing good. Just busy. It's getting cold. <laughs> <laughs> so, where are you, David? Are you in California? Yeah, San Francisco area. Okay. Granted, it's warmer here than other places, but it's uh, it seemed like it went from 80 degrees to about you know, 40 degrees in a week. So it's still adjusting. Yep. And it's weird. It was getting colder here in North Carolina for a while. And then the last week or so, it's been like in the seventies, most states. It's been really, really nice. I'm jealous. Yeah. Although today, um, depending whether you like storms or not, we're getting a really, really good uh, storm out here. Tons of rain and stuff. And uh, is just that from Etta or is that from someplace else? It, I don't know, to be honest. All I know is it's very wet. So <laughs> it probably is from the storm, but who knows? All right, Clemens. Has it been a week again? I know it goes fast, doesn't it? <laughs> wow, it does. I know, we, need, we need like two weeks between each phone call just so we can have time to get other stuff done and then come back and do our real work here. <laughs> uh, hey, Ginger. Doug. Uh, Christian. Hey, Doug. Hello. And Klaus. Hey, Doug. Hello. Do, 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 do. I feel like I missed somebody. Oh, Anish. Hey, Doug. Hello. Yeah, I always think it's funny watching people scramble like a couple hours before this phone call. They start doing updates to their PRs and stuff like that. It's like just funny. I know the feeling. <laughs> I, I know what you're getting at. <laughs> <laughs> well, not just you, but Clemens too, which is doing it. But I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that myself. It's just, I have these grand hopes that, yeah, I'll do it, you know, like later in the afternoon one day or God forbid, even the weekend. It's like then other things come up like not working. <laughs> 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 so, uh, hey, Slinky. Hey. All right. Everybody ready for KubeCon next week? Is everybody going, or at least attending, I should say? Virtually, yes. Mm -hmm. However much I need to. Yeah, I you know it's funny. I don't actually like doing the recordings in advance, but I have to admit, <clears throat> it really does make life uh, less stressful to know that part, is it, part of it is sort of out of the way and you just have to sort of listen to yourself ramble for 20 minutes or so. For, for once we've been smart. Yeah. It feels kind of anticlimactic in the U.S. considering 
Corona and the election. And <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Fabian, are you there? Oh, Fab Fabian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello. 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 Um, somebody else I'm flying by. Christoph, are you there? Yes. Hello. Hello. And Hamid, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Hi. And Simon, are you there? Yes. Hello. All right. One more minute, then we'll get started. Lance. Mr. Lance, are you there? Yes, confirmed. Confirmed. <laughs> so official. We actually have a relatively light agenda today. So if you guys have anything you want to talk about for the SDK call, I know there's at least one item that was added recently, <clears throat> but go ahead and add some more if you want. Uh, maybe we'll talk about the discovery stuff too if we have time. All right, three after. Let's see, did I get everybody? Ginger. Yep, I think okay. we got everybody. Circle back around later. All right, community time. Anything from the community if you want to bring up that's not on the agenda? All right, moving forward. So, KubeCon next week. Um, I believe last time I checked, none of the serverless stuff overlapped with our call next week. However, um, if people want to attend KubeCon um, and there are like sessions you know, during this time, we can obviously cancel next week. So. Question for the folks, or for everybody on the call. Um, should we cancel next week or not? Should I interpret silence as keep it? I would say keep it, but it's just me. Okay. Well, and if you cancel next week, then it'll be two weeks before, because then it's Thanksgiving in the US. Oh, is it Thanksgiving right after that? Oh, you're right, it is. Okay. Well, Not like I participate in this call a whole lot, but I'm just reminding you. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no, this is good. Um, although that that is an invitation for me to pick on you, so there you go. So I'll, I'll keep the reminder. <laughs> no, I'm just the figurehead. I'm the only okay. girl, so I'm, I'm just. You oh, know, that's right. You keep us. Yeah, that's right. You keep us diverse. Thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, so I'll tell you what. Why don't we keep it on for next week? And if for some reason we only get five people showing up because everybody's busy with coupon, then we'll not do anything official in terms of voting or anything. We'll just talk about other stuff. Um, but so we'll base it upon how, how many people we get, okay? Okay, we'll, we'll worry about that later. All right, cool. Okay, so office hours. So thank you for Clemens, Scott and Klaus for agreeing to do um, office hours. I know that not everybody agreed to do both times, but um, there I didn't notice anything on the form that I filled out to say who's going to do which time. So you may get an invite for both sessions, um, which is fine. If you don't, if you only show up for one, that's okay. We do have some people who sign up for both. So just sign up for or show up for whichever one you, uh, you agree to. Um, anything else related to KubeCon that people think we need to talk about? I don't think there is. I think we're all set up, but anybody think of anything? All right, in that case, um, for the discovery interop, since we didn't have SDK call, we skipped that one, but for the discovery interop, um, trying to remember what we talked about last week. Um, I think most people are still just trying to find time to actually do the coding. I know Remy has his endpoint up, um, so maybe we can pick on him to do a demo later when we get to that section of the agenda. Um, but there anything or any topics you wanna to bring up to bring up with their broader group? Okay, in that case, just a reminder again, we'll have the SDK call right after this one. Uh, Timur, anything related to workflow you wanna bring up? Yeah, hi everybody. Yeah, uh, yesterday we released a 0 0.5 version. It's a, it was a big release, about a year worth of work. Uh, and so that was a big thing. We wanted to release it before KubeCon and we also released the Java and the Go SDKs and the VS Code plugin. So we kinda did a big bang thing. It's very exciting. Congratulations. I, I wanted to ask you guys, it's like, uh, I was looking at our website and, and a lot, more than 50% of traffic comes from cloudevents.io. Uh, thank you for putting those links there. And I was wondering if it's possible, maybe uh, we could put just maybe uh, some text or anything anywhere where 
you could say, hey, serverless worker released a new version that would bring a, a lot more views. <laughs> I, I, it doesn't have to be done. I'm just kind of like trying here. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't personally have a big problem with it. I mean, it's not directly related to cloud events, but because we don't actually put up things very often on our webpage in terms of announcements, I think if we can phrase it as, hey, the, the service workflow spec was released and hey, by the way, they use cloud events. You know, so here's a perfect example yeah, for it. Uh, so I think there is definitely a tie in there. So yeah, anybody have any objection to heading down that path? Okay, if, if you and I wanna work offline or if you just wanna go for it and open up a PR against the, um, the web repo, you know, we, we, can, we can work on it later. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions for Timur? All right, cool. In that case, um, any PRs or issues people wanna to add to the list before we jump into them? Okay, in that case, Clemens, I believe you're up first. I didn't notice a push from you. Or was no, there a push I, from you? I had promised to make changes, um, but I had not the time to actually make the changes. So it's still with the promises. Okay. Uh, Are there any well, topics that you'd like to bring up for discussion? We can scroll through the comments if you want to. Well, it's up to you. Is there anything worth discussing that we did not discuss last time? Um, no, I mean, there, there was this one meaty comment by, I forgot who, um, which is questioning, which questioning this entire, the entire existence of the, the URI. Oh, where is it? I know I saw that go flying by. Here we go, this one, right? Yeah, exactly, by, who does that translate into? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I created this comment and and the idea behind that was, if, I don't know, it, trying simplifying things a bit. The, I just noticed the there was a new AP operation added, and there's there's worth described some logic in for the consumers to fetch the schema, and mm -hmm. there was and there was some logic to fetch the schema with the new operation or using the data schema as is, and I just wanted to to propose some some ideas, some options in trying to simplify that and just using one API operation to yeah, let, let me let me try to let me try to explain um, uh, so that's that's the, that's the one thing I probably want want to want to explain on the call if possible uh, the, okay. the the rationale behind this because um, uh, you know this is written in formal language and so there's there's some extra explanation so I hope this helps. The the scenario I'm tr I'm trying to chase here is one that um, is effectively peer-to-peer -peer replication along a flow path of messages, where um, you have multiple and and think of the following think of the following scenario to 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 make this clearer. Think you have several Kafka clusters. I'll, I'll just use Kafka as an example because we have a binding for it. But you can any you think think of any message brokers, and really I'm not thinking about the brokers, but I'm really ta talking about the topics. And you have um, multiple of these in various regions in the world, and there you do local processing, local local events, and now you want to go and consolidate all those events into a single location because you want to um, analyze a global global view, which means you need to have like you have three locations and you have local Kafka clusters in there and you're pushing the data in there and you're doing local local analytics, but then you also have one global Kafka cluster that you replicate the messages, all the messages, all the events into for global analytics. What you will do then is along that flow path, um, as you're setting up that replication, the replication for the data, you will also set up replication for the schemas. So now you have three different areas effectively of your application, which might also differ because of local differences, et cetera, which are effectively three different domains, if you, if you will, um, of authority, where you might have also different publishers. And if you go and consolidate those into a single location, into a single um, uh, schema registry, then you obviously need to have a way to disambiguate um, uh, those schemas. But the events that you publish 
um, in the um, in the original um, um, uh, in the original topics, they will obviously have have to have a unique unique identifier for that schema, which is you know ideally unique in the world. Um, so so that's what this schema this this URI is meant to be. It's a URI that identifies that schema document and the schema so the schema version. So the schema document equals equals the schema version, and that's the 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 goal of that of the of that schema version URI is that you have a unique identifier that you can go and put into the data schema metadata element um, of your um, of your cloud event, and then that lookup function is really meant so that you can walk up to whatever your local schema registry is, the one that is configured for your consumer that may be at this end of this chain, they have this event and that event has this URI here as an identifier for the schema. And then you can go and grab into um, this, uh, um, into your local cache effectively of, of, of schemas and um, obtain that schema directly without having to know what schema group that belongs in because it might have been replicated into a, a particular schema group for, for, for um, um, reasons of, of access control um, and without no, necessarily knowing what the history of that schema is because none of those things are interesting at that point. What's really interesting that is get, that you get a hold of that document so that you can go and deserialize your data. So that's the, so what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to cross, I'm trying to create a, a effectively a, 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 sh a shortcut, if you will, there is, this well-organized way of schema group and schema and schema version for how you manage those schemas and how you can or go and organize them. But then we kind of need to have a, a shortcut, if you will, into that structure um, to, to grab quickly that one schema URI. And then also we need to have a way to, to make those, those, those URIs effectively um, unique um, so that we can go and replicate them across these these flow paths. I hope that makes it a little bit more clear where I'm, what I'm trying to do here. So so it is it is this is one of those things which where I'm using a URI as a as a global identifier. Where arguably this HTTP prefix is is confusing, um, but I need to have, I need to use a, a URI scheme that is um, uh, well-defined. And unfortunately we don't have one um, that we can use that is um, not bound to a particular wire protocol. So that's, that's, why, that's why I'm using those. So yes, exactly. Unique, unique resource identifier as Scott just noted. And so that's, that's exactly what I'm using that for. It's, it's literally the ID of that schema that is global. Um, and that also has a scoping function so that within your local local schema registry, if you don't if you don't ever participate in any of these these com complex replication scenarios, your world should be simple. But as soon as you as you participate in one of those uh, one of those scenarios, then you should be able to go just just pick a name, which is your authority, and then participate in all those replication schemes. And that's that's what that goal is. Does that help in any way? What I just said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, understood. Actually, yeah, it makes more sense to me now. It, it was, I'm thinking that after what you said, it's like what I proposed is actually like splitting that URI into the concepts it defines and, and use the existing API we had available, maybe modify the get schema version API operation, maybe modify it, uh, that operation a bit. And, and as I said, no, split the URI of the data schema into the concepts and use the existing API. But yeah, probably as well as you said, it's a shortcut. The, the, yeah. the main, the main pro proposal from you is like a, a shortcut. And but maybe the, one of the most important things, in my opinion, that you say there is like, you may have an, a replication scenario where you don't replicate the full schema group, but still you have that that concrete schema replicated. So yeah. because of that, you use the, the, the shortcut, the URI to to look up, to, to fetch it yeah. and get yeah. yeah, that's one reason. And, the, and then the, there's another reason. And this is why I'm also kind of enumerating several options 
one of the things you obviously do with schemas is, um, uh, and this is kind of the protobuf and the Avro use case, is that you want to save space. Like that's, so, I mean, there's reasons for, it. I want to have structured data and I want to kind of validate all the structured data. So that's one motivation. The other motivation is that simply you like the fact that protobuf runs very short. Then what we, then what we should, try to avoid is having schema, these data schema URIs, which are three miles long. Um, and so while those schema URIs that are three miles long are great because they're wonderfully legible, um, uh, they're probably not the ideal thing to include with every single event. So I'm also trying to create an avenue here where you can have an enormously greedy URI um, that then ha just has a unique identifier. That's why I'm that's why I'm mandating for this this uh, schema version identifier effectively, uh, something that is uh, unique and can be really terse. Like if you if you're running a local if you're running a registry, I'm imagining because of the way how we've created this that you can just have a counter as your as your I identifier seed. Right, and then um, you can go and prefix that with an, an with with a uh, URI prefix, and then you can end up with uh, you know a URI that's probably ten characters long, with and and still have the structure um, that I have here. So that's also so I'm I'm trying to enable effectively these URL shortener scenario here as well. Okay, okay, just, I've seen that. Okay, thanks for the explanation, by way. Okay, anything else on the PR comments you want to bring up, worth mentioning? No, Jim wants us to move on. <laughs> Notice <laughs> that, did you? <laughs> okay, um, in that case, why don't we do this? Because um, Klaus did want to talk about this issue right here. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to do a Swiss order slightly, because I think Jem wants to talk about this one as well. So Klaus, why don't you? Um, yes, yeah, so it was also brought up uh, from some of my colleagues and I, um, there was this change about the null values in the uh, JSON format. And um, strictly speaking, it's, it's um, not um, totally compatible uh, if you had an SDK that was um, reacting with an error on null values before, uh, as it wasn't clearly specified. Um, and now it would be against the specification to raise an error if there is a null value in the JSON format. So, but that's just one example. It's also that we have now more uh, subspecifications in this cloud events repository, uh, which will have uh, different versions than the main uh, cloud events spec. And, um, I just wonder how we move on with this uh, single repository and, and also the different branches we have in there. Um, I don't have a good solution for this yet. It's just, I think it has become um, more complex and diverse <laughs> over the time. Uh, it was a good start to have this, just a single repository and, and just a single um, master branch. Uh, by the way, we didn't rename it yet, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, that's why I'm asking here for ideas. I raised that issue. Okay. So I feel like there are two different issues here. One is mm -hmm. whether 713 was actually a breaking change or not. And let's, let's yes. defer that one for a second. Okay. Okay. I think the I think the more interesting question at this point is how are we going to handle, as you said, different specs being at different versions, and you kind of implied maybe that it means we should have different repos for each. And I know when we talked about that in the past, people said, we're not, we're not quite ready yet for a separate repo for each spec. And so that's why we kept everything in one, in one repo. Would this problem be solved if we just make it perfectly clear that each spec can have its own version number and just because something is related to Cloud Events 1.0 does not mean that that spec itself automatically gets 1.0. So for example, for the spec that Jim was working on, the protobuf one, I personally think it was a mistake to label it as 1.0 because I don't think it's had time to, to gel and prove itself that it's worthy of 1.0 yet. So personally, I would have preferred that that be 
like a 0.5 version, but it's it's a 0.5 version of the protopost spec for Cloud Events 1.0. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. So that's the second issue. It's true. It's uh, more or less those two. Yeah. So, Jem, what do you think? I'd like to get your take on something like that, since your spec was the latest one to run through this uh, potential issue. It, it's interesting, yeah, because I, I think when I was doing that that spec, um, in my mind, I was going, I was thinking, oh, this is just um, another representation of 1.0. I, I didn't perceive that we would sort of have you know, what were potentially breaking changes in in a in a major version. So I guess the question is really, you know, th those clarifications or other changes that were made around nulls, you know, do, did we consider those to be breaking changes? Because I think if we did, then um, then there's an argument that we went wrong somewhere. If the concern is more, you know, by, by merging the protobuf change, has that sort of locked it in? Is, is that the concern now? It can't, it can't really evolve unless the spec changes. No, I, th I think at least from my point of view, I think the concern I had with the protobuf spec was that it's a brand new spec, and I, I granted, I, I'm sure you guys did wonderful work, but I'm not sure we necessarily have proof that it's been tested thoroughly. Right. right? Okay. And so that made me uncomfortable that we labeled that particular spec a 1.0. Because okay. what if tomorrow we find a major change, we have to change it, right? Does that mean we have to introduce a 2.0 because it's a breaking change for that one spec, right? So I would have preferred for that spec to be a, 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 like a 0 0.5 for at least a couple months for people to play with it and then promote it to 1.0 and basically let each spec have its own version number basically. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I need, is there a danger we run into version i i'd really like to understand how the versioning and everything would work because you're saying the formats would all be independently versioned and the transport bindings would all be independently versioned as well um, that is the, yeah that's the downside it, to this proposal yes yeah i it, it's i understand the problem i i could just see a nightmare ahead that that's all <laughs> yeah yep yes so what um, I had first in mind was discovery and subscription because there we, we are really, in, uh, I think, still learning a lot and, and it's definitely not ready for making a 1.0 for this. Yeah, and I think I think the discovery, or I think the other specs like discovery and subscription, I think those might be a little bit easier to argue that they can have separate version numbers because they're less linked. But to have protobuf be at 2.0 while cloud events is at 1.0, that might look really weird. Um, I, but I mean, you've got the same issue with SDKs. Yeah, your SDKs are going to evolve in true. some way, and and those evolve independently, you know, to the spec. Yeah, they support a, a particular version of the spec. I, I guess now the problem becomes if you version the transports and the uh, formats independently, um, you've got another level of complexity in the in the SDK. Excuse me, in the SDK versioning, because now those authors have to say, well, I know version five of my SDK supports this version of of the cloud event binding specs and this these versions of the cloud event um, event formats, uh, and you've got another level of complexity there. Not saying it's insurmountable, but I think it becomes, um, it, it may become difficult for uh, the population outside this group to understand what, what's going on. Right. So it's, it's also confusing with the branches. So we have a 1.0 branch. And if you now want to uh, do some research, what happened, um, for example, between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 for discovery spec and um, so what branch do you have to look at to, to get that delta, for example? Anybody have any wild proposal? <laughs> um, personally, I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to try to find a way to keep the version numbers in sync. 
uh, at least for the cloud event related specifications if we can. Um, so I think adding a new format like I did, you could conceive that to be a minor version change. Yeah, it, it should, from a cloud event spec perspective, is just a small add-on. And I think your point is when, when do you say, okay, you know, this is now formally part of the spec. I don't know if we went through that with Avro. Um, yeah, but as you do, uh, and Clemens has always, um, threaten to do Seabor uh, or, <laughs> or, or try and persuade somebody else to do it, I should say, um, or XML even. Uh, so you, how do we see, maybe we need to decide how you want to proceed in the future. Uh, and then that will sort of determine how we reverse engineer all that stuff. Mm. Reversion scheme. Well, let me ask you this, at least for the protobuf spec, would we have avoided this issue if we didn't label it 1.0 immediately? And we said, okay, we, we think it's done, but because we need it to have time to be tested in gel, uh, we're going to call it a 0 0.9 and wait six months or whatever, or, you know, pick some period of time. And then if there are no issues found with it, then we can raise it to 1.0. And that's a fair point. I mean, I, um, again, did we do that with the other formats? Probably not. I, you know, I couldn't put my hand on my heart and say, you know, we have enough experience, you know, it, well, me personally to sort of say, oh, the pros above stuff works. Yeah. And I'm not sure what the mechanism is to garner that sort of feedback, you know, to elevate, you know, this stuff yeah. from um, a suggestion to a, a specification. Right. Okay. Um, so what do people want to do? Uh, I, I feel like, okay, I feel like now there's three different issues in front of us. <laughs> One is what specifically do about the protobuf spec? And the reason I say that is because I'm wondering whether we made a mistake by calling it 1.0 and we should reverse that mistake and move it back to 0 0.9 or something. Just because we need it to have time to be tested and we were premature making it 1.0. And I'm meaning I'm looking at you, Jim, to help help make that decision. And because based on what you just said, I'm not sure you feel confident that it actually should be 1.0 right now. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. I, 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 would you feel bad if we if we downgraded it, or or do you feel like it? it no, it really is 1.0 worthy. Well, I mean, I maybe this group. You know, if there are people in the wider cloud event area that have you know picked up that spec and can um, speak to whether it's working for them i don't know if any of the sdk teams have, have tried to support it in their formats so i mean i think it'd be good to get a bit of feedback the interesting thing is you know your prototype people would generally say well we always try and make stuff backwards compatible when we change so what does that what does that mean yeah, um, so I, I would have to think about that a bit more. I, I'm not sure what the implication is. Maybe maybe that's the bottom line. Yeah, this is, I think this is in a slightly better position than you know, the unfortunate one we got into with Jason where we needed to go and essentially uh, change the schema definition, yeah. Yeah, so to me, the implication here is actually very minor in the sense that I don't think it changes what people can code to, I think what it does is it gives us the freedom to acknowledge that we may have made a mistake and this gives us the freedom to change it because once we give it the official 1.0 label, we can't change anything in a backwards incompatible way. Right. Okay. Right. So let me, let me pick on Slinky for a sec. Cause Slinky, I, I, I have this vague recollection that you have actually may have tested the protobuf spec. Was that, am I remembering incorrectly or did you, did you do that? Nope. <laughs> no, you didn't. Okay. never mind then. I apologize. And I apologize. Doug. I do need to drop now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Thanks guys. Okay, Lance, your hands up. I, it, it seems like we're dealing with, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of different things. Uh, like one, we have to, and this has already been said, I'm just gonna restate it. One, we have to think about how we synchronize version numbers across different specs or aspects of the spec. And, and two is sort of the version numbers having some implicit meaning like 1.0 meaning that it's ready. 
And I wonder if there's an, another thing that we can add to, like, so there's the main spec that I think should iterate over the major version numbers and the, the subspecs like the protocol specifications um, could have follow that version number, the, the main spec version number, but have some annotation like whether it's experimental or deprecated or, uh, you know, solid, I don't know, solid's not the right word, but, you know, some sort of annotation to the number that would would help people understand that, okay, maybe protobuf hasn't been tested enough, but it still marches in sync with the main uh, version number. So what's interesting is in the past, we used to do things like have version number dash WIP to imply that it's not quite ready yet or you know release candidate kind of things. Maybe that's what we need to do with protobuf is to make it, as you said, make it really clear this is for 1.0, but it's not quite ready yet. So whether we call it work in progress, which may not be official enough, maybe it's release candidate or something like that and let that gel for a while. Do you think that would, have, is that something along the lines of what you're thinking? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I like I like that because it, it's 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 almost the same as calling it a zero point nine, but it gives it a little more formality to it. And and as you said, it links it with the, the specific version of the main spec. Because if we did yeah. have, for example, a two point zero and a one point zero of cloud events, mm -hmm. you need to know which one it's for. So I like that idea. Right. I mean, I really do think that keeping the 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 version numbers for all of the different pieces in sync is is probably pretty good. Okay. Um, from a, from an SDK point of view, it would it would be a nightmare to have to try and keep that all straight if the version numbers were all disparate. Just taking some notes here. Okay. What do other people think about that idea for dealing with one of the three problems, meaning the problem of a spec is linked to a particular version of cloud events but we need it to be <clears throat> to go through a testing period before we can actually fully claim that it's like 1.0 ready. And we're talking about giving it a some sort of postfix or suffix, um, like a work in progress, release candidate, something along those lines. You can figure out the exact word or acronym later. What do people think? I guess that's similar to what Simon was kind of saying in, in the chat. Hold on a minute. Me, I'm trying to read Simon's stuff. Simon, you want to vocalize what he you're saying? Some, <laughs> he has some connection problems. He, he told okay. me, so that's why he's uh, typing into the chat. Okay. Okay. So I. Th okay. So let, let, okay. Let's let's. So that's the sort of the second issue that we want to talk about. Um, if we're okay with the general idea of some sort of postfix for the name. Um, Let's now talk about the one of the other issues that, that Klaus, you brought up, which was you think <clears throat> we've introduced a breaking change. Now, my understanding that for 713 was we were going to try and, I don't wanna say lie, but squint a little and claim that we just made a mistake, which is why we were okay with not bumping it to be a major version of her. Because technically, if it is a breaking change, then we should have called it 2.0. But I thought we were going to, like I said, squint a little. But do other people remember it differently? In particular, class, do you remember it differently? I wasn't sure what we discussed before about this, so that's why I <laughs> opened up that issue. Okay. Does anybody else remember? Or did for your, let me go back. Over it's here. just uh, technically we we have created that one not zero branch, but we ha never have uh, cherry picked or merged anything we did to master into that branch. That is true. I think I think we may have done very some very minor things in the past, but you're right. In general, we have not. So the question I to me is, should we be looking at doing a one point one? Because I don't personally, I don't think we should cherry pick anything at the one point oh branch, ever, unless it's a you know a, a blazingly obvious typo that needs to be fixed because everybody's going to get confused. But other sort of clarifications, I would think we should go into a 1.1 or a 1.01, something like that. 
and that would be, and that should warrant a new branch because most of these because to me once you create a release that thing should be basically set in stone agreed so so klaus on 713 yep it, let's assume for we, we can revisit this this decision but let's assume for a minute that it was a non-breaking change do you think that we've gone long enough because i think it's been about a year since we went out 1.0 it's do you think pretty much a year no yes yeah do you think we should do a one point something maybe that i'm worried about wire comp back compatibility with the existing um code so the question for me is do we if we change the version numbers do we um, do we actually change the spec for? Do we have to change the spec version? If, if if that is so, then if we have mostly inconsequential changes from a from a wire compatibility perspective for the core spec, um, then I would prefer that we find a different way to version those things and call them kind of you know, have them the errata or whatever. I mean, there's, there's been HTTP one, one has gone through, you know, even going through different uh, to completely new RFCs while, while keeping its version, it's on, on wire version number stable. And that's something that I would um, certainly prefer. Like the, the spec, even the spec version change here that, that we're showing here would break a lot of code. And if there's actually not, not something that really requires that, then we should stay away from this. So, so there, for me, there's the question of what is what does version mean with regards to wire on wire version and and the spec and the, the spec versions. So literally the document versions. Right, and I and that's actually why I, I changed what I was saying before because originally I started talking about one point one and then I changed it to one point zero one because I had this vague recollection that we were only going to have major and minor version numbers in this string. And so what we could do is say that going forward, unless we introduce a breaking change, would actually, which would bump us up to 2.0, as long as they're non-breaking changes, we're only gonna change the patch number. So from now on, it's always gonna be 1.0 dot something. Yes. And, and we're only gonna include the first two digits in the version string. That's something I can live with. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, uh, just for those edge cases now to <laughs> make that big step, um, it's probably a bit too much. Yeah. So, okay. So then let's go back to 713. <laughs> Was this a breaking change? So to, to have a, one specific example, we have some implementation of this. Um, uh, REST API accepting cloud events. And so far it actually reacted with an error message when you had um, a null value in the JSON format. And with this change, that wouldn't be uh, um, spec compliant anymore. Right, okay. So the question I think then becomes, are we just fixing a mistake? And are we going to force people to support the mistake? Any comments? Can you repeat the last question? <laughs> so if, if, if we, if we treat uh, uh, PR 713 as just fixing a mistake, even though we understand it's going to, it could technically break existing implementations. We're willing to tell people to just suck it up and say, look, we made a mistake. You need to support null. I think that's how we should see it, honestly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I mean it's, it's, it's a huge amount of work to make it. Uh, it's to, to implement the difference inside the SDK. I, I, I don't see, honestly, I mean, we can, uh, in, in, at least from the SDK perspective, we can just brighten uh, the next re release change logs that we fix this issue as the spec uh, states. And I mean, you could support both, right? For a Sorry? while. 
you could support both uh, in JSON schema. You have the uh, one off uh, thing that you can define to, uh, let's say this is a breaking change. You could for a while support kind of like in Java where you have a deprecated annotation saying, okay. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that supporting both is not trivial. It's not hard, it, it can be uh, done, but it's not trivial. Oh, but I'm just saying from the JSON schema perspective. Oh, oh you, okay. You okay. can define that where with, you can define both and clearly state this one will be deprecated at some point. I'm not sure that helps us with respect to interoperability though. Right, because if you say you can do either one, then half the you know you, you run the risk of half the world not supporting it, and therefore they're not interoperable. Whereas if we make a a concrete statement that says, "Look, we made a mistake," <clears throat> you're going to have to change your code. At least then people understand that by doing so, they will at least be guaranteed interoperability. Right. I think it's fine to do this statement, honestly. Say it again. I, I think it, I think it's fine to to do this kind of statement and saying we are wrong and we fixed it. So I don't see anything wrong with this, honestly. <laughs> uh, while, while on the other end, I think there is, I think there is very very a, a lot a lot of, of override for everybody uh, to, to 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 bump a new version only for that. Yeah. Klaus, what's your opinion yeah. since you brought this up? Yeah. So uh, I already agreed that. Um, changing the spec version here would be really uh, not, not adequate um, as it's uh, causing a lot of work. Um, so yeah, maybe it's, it's uh, if we regard it as a bug, maybe we do some bug fix release then 101. I mean, then we wouldn't change the spec version as, as you suggested. Okay. Hold on a second, some notes here. Well, okay, what if we did this in addition to that? <clears throat> what if we also send out an email to the mailing list um, saying what we're gonna do here and see what kind of feedback we get. And if we don't hear anything, then that's great. But maybe, you know, maybe we're gonna really piss off our community if we do this and I'd like to hear about it in advance before we do it. Okay. Okay. Um, so hold on a minute. <clears throat> Let's see. So I think what we have here, is we're gonna look at possibly doing some sort of post fix on the version string, for example, release candidate one. I'll talk to Jim to see about doing this for, um, for the protobuf spec, use that as a guinea pig. We'll look at adding some text somewhere that talks about how the version string in the spec will only be the major minor version, not the patch version number. And we're never gonna increment the minor version number. So we're always gonna be zero. Send an email out to the mailing list saying that 713 is a bug um, and get feedback. Good golly. <clears throat> Anything else? What's going on in the chat? <laughs> Simon, you really want to go with the 2.0 soon and really annoy people? That, that's my biggest concern. What do other people think about what Simon said in there? I, I, I think I can add something about uh, the fact that we have a 1.0 branch. So the 1.0 spec, uh, points to, the, to that branch, but we never really uh, share big bugs. So when, for example, in the SDKs, we say we implement 1.0, in fact, we are implementing master. That, that's something that came to my mind now. Like, uh, like for example, all the fixes I, we did at Kafka a bunch of months ago uh, for the Kafka binding, we call it 1.0, but in fact, we are implementing master. So does that make sense, Scott? That's an interesting point. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. 
I apologize. I got a little lost in there. Can you, <laughs> can so, you say that again? So when, when we implement a feature in the SDKs, in, uh, at least that's what I do in all the SDKs where I work on, uh, I look at master. I don't look at the one point of spec. So when yeah. we fix something, when we fix something in, in master, we are kind of implementing master. We are not implementing one point of spec. So for example, uh, pro you probably recall that I found a bug, uh, uh, something that was not really clear in the Kafka spec a bunch of months ago. Uh, and when we fixed on the spec, we fix it uh, in the Cloud Events SDK 2 for the 1.0 version. But in fact, we, that, that's, we, we fixed for 1.0, but, but in reality, we, we fix it uh, given the master spec, not given the 1.0 spec, because the 1.0 spec was never changed. Right. So I'm trying to figure out, okay, then what's the implication of what you're saying there? You're, I mean, you're basically kind of saying that the master branch is in essence, the de facto 1.0, even though it's not called 1.0. Yes. And, and de facto, uh, the, the 713 can, can be treated like and your bug fixes with it to 1.0. And we just fix it in the SDKs and that's it. Okay. But then the, then it seems like the next step after that thought, <clears throat> the next step in that thought process would be, okay, that's great. The, the, the master branch is the de facto 1.0. We should probably make it official at some point by creating a zero dot, I'm sorry, a 1.0.1. Right? Well, at some point? I, I would say we, we should ship a 1.0.1 because these are bug fixes and we don't really want to change the 1.0 spec shape, but I, I do see the points around breaking APIs. Okay, so hold on a sec here. So what I basically think we're saying is, think about releasing, oops. Soonish. <laughs> I don't know. That's something for us to think about. Right? Oh, I'm sorry, there are hands up. Anish. Uh, I'm actually questioning that changes which goes into the master branch, sh should we even call them as 1.0? Because officially we are past 1.0. So should we even call them, let's say, 1.1? release candidate because 1.0 has been out for a year now, right? Like everybody says, and the changes which goes into the master are technically not the stable version. They are development versions. So they are still under development. So we should give them probably a different name under the specification or even in the SDKs, like experimental feature, I don't know. Well, that, that's why I were thinking of releasing a zero, I'm sorry, 101. Yeah, 101 still goes as an official branch of patch release, it's still not like a development release. So if we are following the semantic versioning, that means 101 is a patch on top of 10, it's still not a development version. So it removes your, it, it doesn't gives you the flexibility to introduce breaking changes into your master branch anymore. Well, but if we introduce breaking changes though, that has to be a 2.0. Yeah, but not in development branch because we are still speculating the right specification right, right now. So we wouldn't know that they are breaking changes till we start playing around with it. So calling it 2.0 would be too soon for that, right? I guess I'm not following because I'm my assumption is we have not introduced any breaking changes yet. Ignore 713 for a sec, right? Mm -hmm. My assumption, all the changes we made are either bug fixes or clarifications, something like that, and there aren't any breaking changes. So therefore 2.0 should not really be an option at this point. So my proposal over here is basically, should we introduce something like an experimental version or like something like a feature version where we start getting our hands dirty and then we release these patch versions. And we, once we see that these feature versions are stable, then we upstream them to, let's say, I don't know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and so on. So should we have a provision to play around in some specification like so let me, okay, let me rephrase your proposal. What if we did this? What if we talk about releasing a 101 RC one? And then yeah, once we have that tested, then we can drop the RC one from the name. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. And what should, what should SDK do here? 
I don't think the SDK. Well, I don't think the SDK needs to change, does it? Because until we introduce a breaking change, master and this other branch should basically be the same. Yeah, but how should we align with 713? Should we fix it on, on 1.2? So every cloud event that now we receive should be 713 aware in the SDKs? I would say so once we drop the RC1 from it. Simon, your hands up. If you can get past your audio problems. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I wrote it in the chat again. <laughs> Sorry oh. for that. Um, yeah, so I agree basically with Yoshi and um, So basically, it would be nice to, if you introduce a PR to always maybe classify it, uh, this is just a patch change, this is a minor change, this is a new feature basically, or this is a breaking change. And depending on that, we might choose to merge it into master because we expect the master to be the next 1.1 release or the, then we know we can merge it into master right away and save the hassle. And if you're unsure about that, we, I think maybe we need to create other branches to cherry pick from them and choose the time when to introduce changes. For example, if we know we have multiple breaking changes, it may make sense to collect them and not have many major releases, but to put all of those changes together at a chosen time. Yeah, I think it's that last part that I think is where my head is at, which is I, I personally would prefer not to create a new branch until we're, related, until we're ready to release something. And that means all changes go into the master branch. But with the caveat that we aren't going to consider breaking changes at this time. So therefore, by that, impl that implies everything that's going to get merged into master is, is destined for a patch release. Yeah, okay, if we understand it like that, that would work, yeah. Yeah, because I think everybody agrees, if we, if we, if we merge a PR that's gonna require a major version bump, then that's gonna be a very, very big decision. And I don't think anybody's advocating breaking everybody out there at, at this point in time. And what do people think about that just either write down or have, you know, just an implicit agreement that at this point in time, we are not considering breaking changes, period. Thank you, Francisco. Anybody else? Okay, well, th think about it. We don't have to decide on the call here. Um, I think we have a, at least a, a little bit of a path forward relative to this issue that you opened, Klaus. Um, Klaus, do you want to send out that email or do you want me to? I would be happy if you did that, actually. Okay, okay I'll do it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Um, tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll take all the actions related to this, okay? Because a lot of it is possibly just some additional text someplace um, or reaching out to Jim to see if he's willing to, to do this on the protobuf one. Okay. Klaus, is there anything else you think we're forgetting to talk about relative to this issue? I, mean, I think we're going to probably revisit it, but for, right, <clears throat> but for today, do you think there's anything else? No, but I, I like the discussion. It's, it's good that we talked about it. Yes, it is. And thank you for bringing it up. So, okay. Okay, I don't think I have time to jump onto any other topics, but I don't think any of them are major. Actually, Anish, on your, that is your stuff, right, Anish? Or was that somebody else? Or was that yeah, Sanjay? I think it's, it's yeah. too late for primer pull requests. I think we can ignore that for now because again, oh. it might start discussion. Okay. okay. Uh, but we, we can definitely talk about the issue what I raised, the second one. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, outlining difference between. Okay. I mean, I don't know if this escalates quickly or. <laughs> Go ahead and introduce it then. Yeah, uh, sorry for being abrupt. I just wanted to bring this point into the forum that uh, 
I see a property called subscription config in the discovery API, which looks somewhat similar to the protocol settings in the subscription API. So it would make sense that we start talking about the differences between the two, if there are any, if, but, and, and if there are no differences, then it's probably to check one of these out and then stick consistent across the APIs. So uh, yeah. I, I don't think it's the case. Because what happened is a subscription config is uh, telling you what you are supposed to post in the protocol settings. But when you call the subscription uh, API, you need to have this information from the, disco the discovery API before. So that's why they are similar because basically one is describing the other, but I don't think we should drop any. Um, that is, oh, Doug is just leaving because that's his fault. No, 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 no. no I'm, I'm saying bye to the guys on the call. So to Simon uh, and Scott, I'm, I'll be here, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I want to abandon you guys. I mean, this is something we also talked about last week. So, uh, I mean, I, I, this is really amusing because because you're you're literally now filing an issue on something that we've that Doug has been has been arguing for two weeks ago. Okay. Well, I, mean, I was I was arguing to keep it and just explain the difference between the two. Yes. Because I do see a yeah. difference between config and protocol settings. Yeah. I mean, so, if there are difference, then it's let's. Try yeah. To so so where we are, just for just to for to catch you up, I think where we were was. There are there are protocol settings which are for how the event gets delivered. The subscription, this extra subscription config is really about the event might be acquired if the subscribe if the subscription mechanism has that. So think about a, a thing you want to subscribe on that is not really that is not passing messages through, but that is observing the state of a machine where you say, I'm subscribing on the state of the machine and I'm taking a sample every five seconds. Then the configuration that you would have to pass along with that subscription needs to go live somewhere. That is what we then, that is, that is why I said this bucket might make sense when, when uh, uh, Doug presented the PR to have it. Right. Uh, so, so, so from my point of view, it's like there are a lot of things which are present in this uh, dictionary of subscription config, which might be propagated in the protocol setting dictionary down the line, right? And so should we segregate these things somehow? Like, because I'm, I'm pretty sure there would be some things in the subscription config, which would be propagated to the protocol setting. So uh, I just don't see some sort of consistency here. That's uh, but it's just me, so probably. Uh, I Wait. think there is a lot to still define. Like uh, at least when I did the implementation, uh, or one type of implementation, there was a few incoherence that we need to fix. Yeah. And maybe this one is part of it, like in the global picture. So technically we're out of time, um, but I, I'd like to, personally, I'd, I'd like to work on the PR related to this one whether it's to remove config or at least explain the difference between config and protocol settings. I'd like to work on a PR related to that. And oh, then Anish you, then, yeah, Anish, you can then, you know, jump in, or if you want to take the first pass at it, go for it. And then we can work on it together. I don't care, but I do think we need to, I, I do agree with your issue. We need to clarify it or kill it. One of the two. Yeah. I mean, that, I think then we should discuss again next week so that I have more points and probably find a way, uh, not a way, uh, probably find a place where we can put this, uh, into the specification at these yep. differences between the two. So, yep. Okay. Cool. cool. In that case, technical over time. So, let me just do the quick uh, uh, agenda check, or I'm sorry, attendee check, and then we'll jump over the SDK call. So, Manuel, are you still there? Yes. Hi. Okay. Lu Dang, are you there? I think. No, I don't see him. Uh, Grant, are you there? Yeah. All okay. right. Cool. Okay. Anybody else that I missed? All right, cool. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining. If you're not interested in the SDK call, you are free to go. And we'll start the SDK call in just a moment. Thank you, everybody. Have a good weekend. I, I have to jump, unfortunately. OK. Thanks, hey, Cummins. Doug, the uh, SDK call is on the same recording? It's right here, right now. OK, I'll come back and watch it Saturday. Cool. Yep. Thank you. Yep. OK. Uh, Ready and Anish. I... I jacked you because 
I I thought I had to jump in a meeting, uh, but I can. No worries. My... No, I, no, I can I can move I can move my my topic. But but uh, Slinky, please do me a favor and state at my point. Sorry. I mean, just do me a favor and stay till I talk about my uh, my agenda, if you can, please. What you said? He wants you to stay on the call so he can, so he can hear your opinion on his topic. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, then I can keep my topic. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. You guys crack me up. Okay. Let's get started then. So Slinky, you're up first. Yeah, so two announcements. Uh, so uh, I made last week uh, the release of SDK Rust 0 0.3. And by the way, I need to add the links because the links are cool. And a lot, a lot of breaking changes, but you know, it's uh, we are still in a very, very premature phase, but things are starting to get a little bit more stable. And there is some contributors working on it, so I'm not only uh, the only one, unfortunately. And in the next release, we will get uh, noise TV support, so cloud events on, micro on microcontrollers, Ooh. and then hmm. QTP. Uh, while for SDK Java, I did a release this week, and I hope to do uh, another one next week. And we finally managed to solve the the most outstanding issues, uh, the most important questions. In particular, there was this question that took quite some time to, to solve it, which was how we deal with, uh, uh, with the, the cloud event payload, how we represent the cloud event payload inside uh, the phases. And that's done. So we solved it. Uh, maybe it's not the best solution, but you guys check it out and let me know how it looks like. Um, uh, I, I will try to rush uh, for the final release uh, for the final for the 2.0 GA before Christmas if I manage to. Uh, but I definitely need some help with reviews. In particular, I need uh, I will really really love to see at least uh, the implementation of Protobuf or Avro or both because they I think they are really really important. I heard that J. Uh, J the name is Jay Wright. He was interested in, in protobuf inside SDK Java. And yeah, if he, if he wants to step in or somebody else and help with that, because I, I really, really need help for that. And I am already flooded with all the other issues of the SDK, like documentation, this kind of boring stuff. So do you have any questions? Con congratulations, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's exciting. Any questions for Slinky? All right, cool. Thank you, Slinky. As I said, it's very exciting. Always great to see a lot of forward progress there. All right, Remy, I think you're up. Uh, yeah, but if Anish wants to go first, like before me, uh, so Slinky can answer, I'm fine. Yeah. Oh, so you want that? Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, so basically I, I, I got a chance to play around with the Java SDK and then that got me thinking uh, that, that the API model for SDKs are, are really different, like especially if you're coming from a Golang world where you use the, uh, these cloud event receivers, you start a cloud event receiver. So basically the general uh, developer interface for the SDKs are really, really different when you come from Go and and suddenly you start playing around with Java. So I wanted to propose like, should we think about a consistent API model for the end users in order to uh, like give, give a consistent experience when they want to invoke these SDK APIs? So should we even think about it? Or yeah, I'm, I'm probably thinking too much. <laughs> uh, Slinky, your hands up. I have a very strong opinion about it. <laughs> Okay. I think we should not even think about that because, okay. I mean, you, you weren't there <laughs> eight months ago, <laughs> but communities are, uh, of different programming languages are so different that, and languages itself are so different 
that even thinking about a model that can work for everybody, it's just a complete waste of time. So I, 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 I contribute to three SDKs. I contribute to SDK Go, to SDK Java, and SDK Rust. And I can tell you that I never ever managed to find some, even in some basic interfaces, a common paradigm that we can use. So like, for example, the whole sender receiver thing uh, mm -hmm. that we have in SDK Go works pretty well with Go because in Go, for example, uh, you have a single way to manage uh, blocking and non-blocking. Okay, so the semantic of blocking and non-blocking, it's straight inside the language itself. This is, for example, not doable at all with Java because in Java, you have 10 different ways to manage sync and async, to manage streams, uh, uh, to manage blocking and non-blocking. So for the, the kind of interface that we have in Golang SDK cannot work at all in SDK Go, in SDK Java. And another example, in SDK Rust, uh, the receiver model that we have in SDK Go doesn't make sense in some use cases because maybe I'm integrating with a, uh, with a library like Actix Web where you already have a very well-defined paradigm to handle requests, to handle events. So you just need to integrate with it more than trying to create your own interface that is consistent across programming languages and across SDKs. So what I'm trying to say is that it's a huge pain and mm -hmm. we, uh, we, it will get us nowhere. Uh, okay, I just wanted to bring this discussion because it was really, really uh, a world of difference when I switched to the Java SDK. Yeah, well, but probably see there's a reason. Java SDK it. has to be improved for sure. And if you have any concrete top topics on the improvements of the APIs, I'll be really, really happy to discuss about that. Uh, that's for yeah. sure. I mean, the Golang SDK is, is just more developed, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, said that, again, the consistent API model across all the SDKs it just doesn't sound right to me. Okay, cool. So, so remember your hands up. Uh, yeah, I uh, just agree with Slinky. I think like even when you look at TypeScript, it's too different from like Go to, to be able to have something that looks alike. Okay, I just wanted to say, I, I may be remembering incorrectly, but I think in the past when this issue has come up, we landed in the same position that, that, that Slinky said. The answer was basically no, however, I do think that people acknowledge that if there was a very particular feature or aspect to the SDKs that makes sense to be common, that, that we could explore that, right? And, and bring it up as separate issues in each SDK to say, hey, look, what if you did this particular small little thing, not doing it because you want consistency, but because it makes sense to do in general for that language, it still makes sense. Then we can get consistency for those things sort of indirectly. But, but only because it makes sense for those all the languages to do the same thing, not because we're trying to push for consistency. I think we had a conversation like that, but I don't know, maybe I'm remembering correctly. So it so, makes sense. Yeah. So Anisha, if there is something you'd like to see consistent, then yeah, push for it in each individual repo. And if they all happen to agree to it, then hey, you get consistency, but it's not for <laughs> consistency's sake. Yeah, I, my my major concern was with with the sender concept because like the sender concept in Go is is just so seamless, but with Java it was it was just crazy, and yeah, so I would probably see if I can drill down that particular concept for Java as well. That's it. Okay. okay. Yeah, Slinky, your hands up. Yeah, just to close the discussion, I can even tell you that one of the things that you might think are simple to do, like representing the data field, the data, uh, the payload the okay. event. We solve it in four different ways in the four SDK, in, in the four major SDKs we have. In SDK Rust, we have a union type. Uh, and in this union type, uh, we are tied to uh, the JSON library because it's fine to do that in Rust and to tie to that particular library that everybody uses. In mm -hmm. Java, we didn't want you to do that because everybody wants to use its own library. So we had to create an interface that abstracts over the data and then everybody implements it. Then in SDK Go, uh, we, we have just a byte buffer, but then the interface allows you to map directly to, to the data structure. In uh, C Sharp, we just return any, an object, uh, whatever. So an untyped object. Uh, in JavaScript, I don't know how we do that, but just, just to tell you that even the simplest thing is hard to make 
consistent. Um, I, I get it. I completely get it for sure. For the yeah. sender in Java, well, just open issues and for, for mm -hmm. which particular module did you find the issue? For which particular integration did you find the issue? The message sender, the basically the message reader and message writer interfaces. I mean, I'm, I was not able to digest those two interfaces very well. So, okay. okay. But yeah, I think this is something I would just uh, spawn a, a parallel conversation with you. Sure, sure. Cool. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I was on mute talking. All right. Thank you, Nish. Um, uh, Remy, you're up. Yeah. Um, so it's just because um, I did the increment, like a part of the implementation of subscription discovery. And while doing that, um, I noticed that I think the way we emit a message in the JavaScript SDK was not uh, super pluggable. Uh, so I did a PR that can can present. If, I don't know if it's like the right time. If people I can understand like people who are not on the JavaScript SDK might not be super interested. But uh, if for Lance or Grant, we can discuss that. Are you saying you want to talk about the PR right now? Yeah. You want, you want to share your screen then? Yeah, I can. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll, I'll drop out or I'll stop sharing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's me talking. You you go out. <laughs> um, so the thing is, uh, so when I was trying to implement the discovery, one of the like discovery and subscription, basically the subscription, you don't know who's gonna subscribe before uh, they subscribe. So when you do that compared to if we take probably the example of how we are supposed to emit, uh, I guess it's uh, there. Uh, here, the guy who create the event is basically already knowing to who he wants to send it. And in fact, even if I use emitter four, it's going to be the same. It means like I already know where I need to send it. While in my opinion, when I do development, uh, I would prefer to not know as a developer, like to not know at all uh, where I want to send and just say, okay, I'm going to emit one, um, one event. So basically I see it more like that in my code. And then anyone who wants to do something with these events can just do something like that. So you will say when there is a new event, I will emit it to the either an endpoint or anything. With that type of parading, it allows me to create a subscription service because the subscription service will know who has subscribed and will basically uh, subscribe to that type of events to be able to push to the, its own subscriber. And as a developer, I don't know what, who is going to subscribe to my event. Like, I don't know any of those. So I need a way to emit uh, with abstraction of the other people I are doing. So to implement that, I came up with just like, instead of uh, deprecated the full emitter class as it was, I just use it as a single singleton to be able to listen to that singleton on those specific events or with like the event emitter to be able to abstract uh, to who I'm sending. So this way, when I code a class, I just say, okay, like I'm gonna do five new events. I'm just generating those events and I don't care who's listening. Because I think in the current implementation, like I, if I have to do that, uh, it's useless because I, I put it, sorry, I should not be that opinionated, but it seems to me really hard. Like if I have five classes that emits each of them, like five cloud events, I should not have to pass the emitter because at that point in time in when I code, I don't care who's gonna listen to my events. So that's why I came up with that uh, ID. So if you look, uh, that's probably just mostly a formatting issue. But uh, so that's the thing I demonstrate to you how I envision it. And I just 
remove the deprecated from the emitter class to change it to something like a single point where we emit all the events and then uh, you can listen and but you decouple basically the transport from the emitting of the event by itself inside uh, another application was it clear or oh, i took too long <laughs> Lance, I think your hand went up there for a sec. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't had a chance to to look at it yet. I'm, I'm wondering, are you using the, oh yeah, there you are. You're using extending event emitter. You're using the built-in node stuff. So when um, in the code sample that you showed, you have, you know, the singleton dot on, can you show that again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that is that's using um, the node built-in event emitter stuff, right? So any any piece of code within that same process could call that same function, provide a different emitter. So an, a, a cloud event could be emitted multiple times for a single event. Is, correct. is that right? Yeah, one hundred percent correct. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, and like the only question that raised uh, that I raised uh, then when I finished like my implementation was uh, I might remove the like the official event emitter to do the same kind of implementation, but um, internally just to be able to because it's gonna probably be asynchronous like those functions, and so maybe when you emit, you want to make sure that it's completely emitted because if you're in the node, like otherwise it's going to be in the node um, queue and you don't you, you cannot be 100 percent sure that the event has been received on the other side so depending you might want to we might want to change to be to have that ability that ability so either you will do a await on the emit or if you don't care you don't put the uh, the await and then uh, it's just sending uh, so I might still change on that, but I really think it's useful. And at the end, what it uh, so what I was able to generate was like this demo that I probably demoed a, a few time ago. So this is like uh, the gateway. You can add services. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yep. And because I did implement like, so when you, when I subscribe on the right panel, we see the events uh, arriving. And here is a discovery uh, to detect how many service you have. And when I do that, I, I really needed something like I just shown you to be able to plug into the SDK efficiently. Uh, so let's say I had Garfield as well. So now I have like a cat service and a ping service. So I can subscribe to both if I want, and then I'll see uh, like the events arriving there. Uh, so here, and, uh, but I and what I did, but that's a little bit more out of scope. Is like a gateway that is able to when you subscribe. So by default, it has no service, and if I connect the gateway, it will start. Uh, you can aggregate several services. So right now, now the gateway is aggregating the ping and the Garfield service. So I can just uh, use the gateway uh, to to retrieve all the events from several other services. But that's probably out of scope. But while I was doing that, so basically that's why I came up with the emitter because I think it's a nice way to completely decouple the transport uh, part from uh, emitting the event. So if we agree on that, uh, I think uh, I will probably change it to to be able to have a, a wait on the emit event to make it a promise. So you can decide if you want to wait for the promise or not. And by doing that, I have to implement my own uh, type of event emitter, but I'll, I'll take exactly the same uh, methods name if that's fine uh, with you. And I have a, the other PR is basically just uh, 
it's more simple. It was just to add some types. I, I decoupled it from the rest, but I think uh, we should have all the types coming from the discovery service and uh, it doesn't uh, include anything. And my, <laughs> so that's uh, for first one, unless um, anyone has other questions. I, I guess I had a comment. Um, yeah, sure. With, with like the, uh, just sort of with the naming, like with get singleton, mm -hmm. I feel like that, like, I guess I don't really see that naming pattern in, in Node in JavaScript, the singleton pattern. Um, yeah. Maybe we could have it like, I, is it like a static? Uh, yeah, um, in fact, that like so it's good that you raise that because um, if I remove the, like I had to use a singleton because I was not able to use static because I wanted to uh, over like uh, extend the event emitter. But if we uh, uh, remove that event emitter part and we just go with static with uh, promises, which I think is more efficient, we can do a emitter on and remove basically the this and declare on as a static. And then we'll, we'll have something more clean, I think. So um, I, I, I want to move like, I can update the PR to reflect that if we all agree that it's a better, if I understood I, you correctly. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And uh, I guess another thing is, so with the on event, are there other on, like first parameters on something else or it's more because it came from the event emitter normally you define the type of event um i think when i thought about it uh we might want to i was i was thinking we can like the emitter can emit an event when a new subscription arrives and when someone unsubscribe basically when you do a add, so when you call the on it should send an event saying a uh, new subscription i'm not sure it's going to be useful but uh that was my thought so that's why uh, i put that like first because it, event emitter it was uh, mandatory but even if we move from event emitter i think we should keep the same uh, signature one one concern I have is um, having all of the like subscription stuff um, and discovery stuff in the the current module. Um, yeah, yeah. One of the things. So I like if, about I, the if I if I may, <laughs> that's my that's my next point. And basically, yeah. my goal is not to have them inside. It's just that's why uh, like for me that's like the only modification we need to do in the SDK. And then uh, after discussing with uh, Grant and you like two weeks ago, I think, um, I do agree that we should probably split and we should have what I will call the cloud events uh, dash service, which is basically the discovery implementation, the full discovery implementation and the full um, subscription implementation, but as a side module that you can either choose to pick or not, it's up to you. But to be able to implement those modules efficiently, if we don't have those kind of uh, stuff, it's not going to be possible. Right. I guess um, what I was talking about is less the that emitter stuff and more, let me just, um, the other interfaces that you added in 365. Um, I'm just wondering if if the well, I guess those are needed, but it's not needed. I could put it in the other module. I just thought that I think it makes sense to make them um, available because it's just interface. It's not like it's overloading the. I don't see it as overloading the SDK by adding the definition, all the definition from the norm. But so so what what you're thinking is is that um, some you know secondary module or, or some other module that is like the you know cloud events discovery module in JavaScript um, is 
is has a dependency on this module and just uses these interfaces from this module. Yeah, that's yeah, correct. That's that's what I did. Mm. Uh, that's how I did implement. Uh, like if you look yeah. the discovery, it's gonna so the SDK definition. So that's why, in fact, I don't really care if we put them in the SDK or not. For now, I put them on the side here in the definition. But I think it should be in the SDK. So instead of that, I should see uh, from a cloud event because then we know the SDK is about exposing the right interface based on the on the specification. The implementation is always something that's why you wanted to get away of the implementation in the SDK, which I agree with. And then the service can be opinion, uh, opinionated on how to implement. But um, I don't think we should have, the because then the service will be the implementation. So I don't think the service should have the definition of those extra classes. Yeah, that makes sense. I, that makes sense, OK. Uh, I mean, I, I I think there'd be a lot of value in extracting, um, especially like some of the discovery implementation from the SDK module, because like, for example, receivers don't want to keep updating the SDK if the SDK has a new major version for some discovery feature. Yeah. Yeah, and it potentially for security reason also, you might have more issue with security and uh, discovery, and, uh, specifically more the subscription, I guess. But <clears throat> yeah, I do agree with you. So that's why uh, I think like I'm gonna split it uh, and just contribute uh, like the discovery. What I did here is just like, for now it's not clean enough. It was just to make like the example, but uh, I want to cut it part of this code to have uh, cloud events uh, dash services, unless you do have another name. Or... I guess um, the a practical question, if you split it out is, um, uh, is should they, should we do this as a mono repo under SDK JavaScript? That's kind of what yeah. sort of <laughs> makes sense to me. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, not, mon not but yeah, mono repo. Um, getting my terms confused, uh, where we publish two different modules from single repo, as opposed to like building a second repo or having another repo. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, <laughs> we can do that. It's a little bit more more work on, on the original repo. It's just like Lerna is well tooled to do that, but uh, it's like a big change. Yeah, it's it does change the structure of the thing, but. But I, I, I'm okay with that, of course. I mean, I guess the, the only reason why I feel like it, it should be that way, well, I mean, um, I, I guess if there was a, a new repo, we could have it be, you know, discovery-javascript or something like that, so that we don't take up the namespace of discovery or subscription. Um, I, I think there's yeah a lot of value in um, having multiple modules in the same repo. Um, I mean, for example, I could even imagine um, folks that don't want to, yeah, folks that don't want to send cloud events, they just want to receive cloud events, they can just use the receiving module Folks that only want to send events, never want to receive events, maybe can use a sender mm -hmm. pattern. And then we can split up dependencies so we don't need to have dependencies that are used just for one part uh, be required. Yep. Uh, Slinky and an issue of your hand up. Yes. Uh, uh... Okay. So, so slinky first. Sorry, Anish. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, I, I, so, sorry, no, Anish, go first. No, no, go first. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I think this so was somehow already discussed in the past. 
uh, the, the thing of supporting discovery and subscription in our SDKs. Now, I have mixed feelings about that because uh, let's take, for example, SDK Java, SDK Rust, SDK Go. We are already have a lot of modules in the repo and we have all aligned version. So, which means that when we ship, for example, uh, SDK Java Core, we ship together SDK Java API, we ship together SDK Java Jackson, uh, Vertex, uh, RESTful Web Services, uh, Kafka, and all the modules all together. So when we do releases, we have all the releases aligned. And that's the simplest way to, 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 to release stuff, okay? If, we, uh, so what I'm hearing from this discussion is that we want to keep in a separate module because we want a separate module and, that, and that's correct, that's fine. But at the same time, uh, we think that two, the, the, the two things can evolve at different pace and that's a problem. So my feeling it's the opposite is that we should have a separate repository where we push the discovery stuff and where we push the subscription stuff and in this repos and this repository depends on fixed versions of this decay. If we think that there is this different pace, if there isn't any different pace and we think they will proceed the same, then I don't see any issue. Uh, but for the example, uh, if if I if I go GA with SDK Java, like we do, I do like SDK Java V two, then I commit to don't break APIs. And if we uh, decide that we want to add a new module for discovery, for example, then when this module is released, I have to commit to, to this mo uh, to, to, to don't break APIs of this module, okay? Because I'm I'm aligning the versions when I release, so that's that's kind of problem in this sense. Particular for stable modules, the, the same goes for SDK Go. Uh, I, like I think in TypeScript, it's easier because like. Uh... It's pretty well tooled for mono repo, so you can even have separate versioning. Like that's what I use on most of my project. So they depend on each other, but it's like you can still have several pace of uh, release. So in our case on TypeScript, I think the mono repo makes sense to me. I don't know enough on some other technology <laughs> to to have an opinion. Well, maybe we can do differently for every language as we always do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> let's go back to our previous. <laughs> I mean, we can do that. I, I have no problems. I mean, for 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 Rust, I'm I'm aligning versions now, but it's not that problem for the tooling to keep versions disaligned. But for example, it's a problem for SDK Go, and it's a problem for Java. Yeah, and but I really think, as Grant mentioned, that uh, I think the discovery and uh, and the subscription API will evolve uh, uh, almost like on a product basis, whereas the SDK is supposed to evolve more like the spec uh, pace, which is usually I think slower um, because the discovery you have basically it's the real world, like you really need to implement some stuff and. Uh, and that means you'll create some security issue maybe, and you'll have to fix them like more quickly. That's the way I see it. Maybe I'm wrong, yeah, I'm not. Uh, having in a separate module is definitely, is definitely the way to go. My, my question is more separate module and separate repo, repo or separate yeah. module. But, but I mean, if that's not a problem for the TypeScript tooling, then I'm glad with it. Anish? Yeah, uh, I mean, for me, uh, like I think we need to answer that. How is it? First of all, the time that we should incorporate the discovery and the subscription API as part of our SDKs in all in all together, right? Because currently the specification is like really, really at its nascent stage, mm -hmm. and uh, probably making it part of the SDK would not be a nice idea. Otherwise, we would end up with like these consecutive SDK releases. Uh, you know, we would probably overwhelm our SDK releases with every update into the specifications, right? And uh, another concern what I 
I mean, just we just came out of this discussion was like, I, and it, it's my personal opinion, of course, that uh, I, I really believe that the subscription and discovery API should definitely be part of the core cloud event SDK because uh, because now we when we ship an SDK, we would be we we kind of tell that okay, this is the implementation for all of our specifications. So I kind of don't like this uh, different repository thingy for sure. But for how me, do we ship different it? Different module. It's just the way you, the way you build application in TypeScript is just to have different modules. So this way, if you don't want to implement the service uh, like the discovery and the subscription, you can just take the SDK, build like build with that, and then you can just like add the other module if you really want to inherit like those new feature but uh, like yeah i think it it made it makes sense to me to separate and it's because the from wrong the, the implementation of the api can be done through express it can be done through other framework like basically my demo is using a serverless framework i did develop so it's not exactly the same type of implementation you're not using the same stuff and when you implement an open API, basically, like it's the same in Java, you can do it with Spring, you can do it uh, like uh, old school, you can do it uh, with JaxRS, uh, and it's not going to end up with the same type of code. So when you implement for real the API, you take decisions when you implement. Yeah, but the, today if we implement, let's say if we introduce a module for the discovery and the subscription API, and let's say the JavaScript SDK, do we give a message to the community that, okay, now officially we started supporting these APIs as part of SDKs and then they would start expecting it in all the other ones as well, right? So when we release them in one, then I think ideally we should release them in all. It's, um, I, I don't know if that's the standard process. I, and different different F SDKs have different levels of support. I think in general, I, yeah. there's nothing in the spec that, that indicates that an SDK needs to do anything more than support version 1.0 of the spec. But, you know, as you, as was discussed in the last meeting, you, you found that there are a lot different capabilities with different SDKs and um, and unless there's something in the specification that says the SDKs must support you know, the subscription or discovery services. Mm -hmm. it, it, it seems like, it, at least for the time being, it would not be a problem for them to necessarily be out of sync on that, in my opinion. I think it's fine, yeah. I was just hoping that we don't raise expectations in that area that, okay, suddenly JavaScript comes up with implementations and then Go and Java doesn't have one, right? So, or we start breaking a workforce that we also introduce these uh, specs into the Go as well as the Java SDKs. But that's something what we need to decide within the community, right? Thinking, do you think we should start implementing subscription and discovery API as part of standard SDK? For Go and Java, at least. Do you? <laughs> he ghosted. He ghosted us. Who, 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 I'm sorry. Who, were you asking me a question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I know Doug is not paying attention. No, yeah, sorry. I, I, I usually don't do much with the SDKs. So that's why I kind of tuned out a little. I was doing some something else. So what the was the question on the table was like so the, and now we have a PR which has uh, one of the implementations for the subscription and the discovery API spec uh, as part of the SDK so there's a PR which can go in so officially we might start having support for the subscription and discovery API implementation from the JavaScript SDK whereas on the other hand the Java and Go SDKs have not even thought about it yeah so we are I, um, in inconsistent stage at this level. I, 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 keep in mind, I am not a maintainer on any SDK. This is just my personal opinion, which means nothing. Um, <laughs> I personally thought it was a little bit weird 
to try to incorporate a cloud events SDK with the discovery and subscription stuff. Because to me, while the while they may use cloud events to some extent, I, I view them as separate projects. But I know in the past, I've heard other people say, no, it makes perfect sense to merge it. So I personally think it's weird, but I have no, personally, I have no problem with people want to merge it if they think it, if, it's, if, it's, if the SDK thinks it's the right thing to do. Can, well, I, can I clarify something? Yeah. Um, so I think um, we're, we're not, to, I, if, if I understand the conversation correctly so far, what we're talking about doing is in having implementations of the um, discovery and subscription APIs in the GitHub repository called SDK JavaScript. But it is published as a separate NPM module. Each one probably subscription is published as it's you know cloud events subscriptions and discovery published as cloud events discovery, and then the the main bit that is that implements the uh, cloud event um, specification as well as the HTTP protocol binding and you know things like that um, that is published as its own uh, module NPM module as well. So they are distinct. They uh, they do version independently um in ideally the the top level one the cloud events module uh that really is just the implementation of the spec would um, provide interfaces that the subscription and the discovery apis uh or implementations uh use uh but there's not a, a dependency in that way so that the cloud events sdk doesn't depend on the subscription api does not depend on the discovery api um, the discovery API and the subscription API depend on the interfaces defined in the cloud events SDK. Is that so, a correct uh, summarization of the discussion so far? And maybe I just added, embellished a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's uh, and if that's the case, it, it, does that seem as weird to you, Doug, or not? Well, I mean, I so if there's no direct like dependency between them, is the reason that this is happening simply because we don't want a proliferation of GitHub repos? I would say that's part of it, but I would, but I, but there is the, de, you know, the, potentially the dependency on the interfaces that doesn't necessarily have to be there. But um, I mean, the fact they're separate NPMs, I think, sure that that lessens the weirdness a little. I, not enough for me to not call it weird, but like I said, my opinion doesn't matter, <laughs> right? I mean. If you guys think it's, it makes sense to be part of the SDK, go for it. I mean, as long as the as long as the code is out there, I think that's that's the biggest thing. Where it sits in which repo or stuff like that, I, that's that's secondary. Uh, I, so just to give some context, uh, my context is just to try to get something working in my uh, company where people can just discover new events, and that's why I, I'm always surprised. Because for now, just the SDK without discovery, without um, the subscription, means that everything is statically uh, defined, and like that's not the way I see uh, my architecture. <laughs> uh, so that's why I'm pushing uh, more, and I'm happy to see the discovery and the subscription being a little bit more real. And I think it. it logical as a group to try to push like the full solution to explain how it works and how it can interact together because the interaction works only if you have like the not only but nicely i will say if you have description and uh, subscription discovery and subscription sorry and so have you reached out to the to like the golang sdk and and about this idea and did, did you get resistance or, or they just haven't gotten to it yet I don't know, like I didn't get any resistance for anyone for now. I was just uh, trying to, I, and I still think we need to work on the subscription API a little bit more. So I'm like, not like. No, I think we discussed this uh, some few weeks back that first we would try to implement it as a part of the interop call. And if the specification seems tangible, the, at that moment, we start defining the, the specification into the Golang SDK as well as in the Java SDK. That's what I can remember. Okay, so it sounds like you will, <clears throat> you will you will have done that path for the other ones as well. Just a matter of timing. 
Yeah, exactly. So I just so my my major concern over here was like, should we synchronize the timing that when these implementations step up into uh, these corresponding SDKs, should it be all together or should, is it fine that uh, it comes in one of the one of the SDKs first and then later on for the other ones? I, I think it's fine that they're they're staggered. I don't think they have to do it all at the same time. But okay, then then that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Slinky, your hands up. So, 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 so let, let me understand. You are saying that you you are willing to to implement soon sooner the uh, discovery API subscription API for uh, Golang SDK and Java SDK. I mean, yeah, at some point of time, uh, if, okay. if not this SDK, but in a different repository. So we would probably formulate the tasks into the SDK okay. Go issues. Yeah, I think but I think we should we should. To discuss maybe another time, but we should discuss where to place it because yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. We should have it, but where to place it, uh, it's kind of a problem. Yeah. But it, it, it has a dependency for us, as I mentioned, on the interop. So first we will figure out uh, as a part of our interop work group that the specification currently even makes sense as it is right now. So either we have to probably evolve it a bit or we can use it as it is. So we would decide that as part of the interop and then we would start discussing how to, we want to incorporate it into the SDKs. So that's okay. the discussion I could remember. So okay. for, for me, it needs to evolve, uh, it's uh, sure. So it's a work in progress, but I just wanted to put like the base and the implementation so we can iterate on that and make sure that we are all on the same page. So at no point I thought like that implementation is the final one, is the final one. I'm sure we're going to iterate on that. Okay. Um, anything else for the agent for the call? It's good discussion. Uh, I, I just wanted the, <laughs> so uh, to be sure, like Grant and Lance, you think those PR make sense, and uh, with a small update, we'll be able to merge them. Uh, well, so are we? We're splitting the, the modules first, right? I think we could merge those one and then do the Lerna split uh, because the two PR are not about uh, discovery and uh, it's just uh, some uh, tweaks in the SDK. And then, uh, yes, we can do the Lerna. Uh, I suppose we'll have to synchronize for that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I what, what, what number again? It's 365 and 366, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that they deserve an actual, you know, longer read. GitHub review, but yeah. conceptually and all that, it, it makes sense to me um, to land these as they are and then move towards a mono repo with the discovery and subscription APIs as separate modules. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, I think that the main concern I have is just uh, like for an SDK receiver, like having any discovery functionality is not really wanted. So um, as long as like things are split soon, or I, mean, I guess I, I don't think that's what's being proposed. That like yeah. the, these two PRs don't have discovery API implementation in them, other than the interfaces. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah. The the emitter and. Uh, I mean you. Yeah. I mean, interfaces don't really, um, I mean, I, I'd imagine even like the interfaces for, um, sorry, I, I need to look at the PR more. Are, are these interfaces for discovery? It's just the definition of the spec from discovery, so yes. But it's just interface. It's basically yeah. just declaring. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Are are you planning to publish it in the the main module or? Yeah, that was the discussion. Like for me, 
it makes sense to be in the main module. Uh, if we decide to split it and put it in another module, uh, it's possible also. It's currently the case on my implementation, so it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, the the really super important one is the emitter one. I think the emitter one is something that uh, if we don't do, uh, like basically, I cannot implement uh, or like I cannot implement subscription. Well, I, I really like the emitter one, and I think that it it brings some real node specific kind of um, idioms to the SDK, like actually using the node event emitter. Um, that's nice. Yeah, okay. I don't, don't remember, I'll, I'll move to like the same uh, interface of the event emitter, but with uh, asynchronous. So this way we mm -hmm. have like, uh, so it's gonna look like, but it's not gonna be the event emitter per se now, but uh, I think it looks like it's enough. Right. Do you want to um, put this on a, uh, uh, put that, sorry, uh, put that PR into WI uh, work in progress status until you make those changes? Uh, yeah, last time I did that, <laughs> it, it went into, uh... It was never merged anymore. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I did add a comment to just say that uh, I'm gonna implement that. Uh, but I, I, that's pretty quick to do. So I hope oh, to okay. do that today. So, yeah, whatever. Doesn't okay. have to be work in progress. I just don't want it to sit there for a long time without changes. You know? No, no, yeah, I'll do. Uh, like, yeah, I just converted it to draft, and I'll just uh, update. Uh, I'll just update. But I uh, I want to do it like today. Uh, same thing. I don't want it to be sitting uh, too long. I don't like. <laughs> yeah. But, and uh, give a second thought on uh, like the interface grant if you want for the other PR. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go review it unless I to merge. I, I think we should definitely try to split the SDK. Um, sooner than later yeah but this is fine yep more of you okay thank you guys for listening <laughs> okay. all right yeah. glad you brought right, it up cool. have a good rest of your day then bye, bye guys bye. 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 Bye.